Being deeply loved by someone gives you strength, while loving someone deeply gives you courage. I've never heard this quote before, I googled it for this essay. It seems to me for a topic as ubiquitous and universal as love is, it can be hard at times to conjure up the perfect words to describe it. But we all know it when we see it. That infectious, insatiable, all-consuming feeling. Some say it's the only feeling worth writing about. It pervades every single facet of our art and literature and society, appearing as parody or cliché almost as often as it does sincere. It's known to wear many faces, play many parts, from the fleeting qualities of superficial love, the love one might feel during their formative years, to the lasting bond of love that builds upon decades of shared history. Love, more than anything, is a profound feeling to feel. But what about loving someone deeply despite what the cost of loving them can bring about? Love that results in harm done unto you by those who wish to silence that love. Love that tests one's resilience at the notion of being unconditional, even in the face of fascist power structures. For me, in order to truly talk about love, I need to talk about what I love. It's a tragic consequence of being a writer, I guess. And in this case, what I love is art. And issue 6 of V for Vendetta is art, depicting a story that begins with vengeance and ends with Valerie. But before we get to Valerie, we have to start with Eve, the girl saved from sexual assault by the anarchist V, a character at this point in the comic story we've grown entirely all too familiar with. In issue 6, we're already a way a ways removed from Eve's introduction as the darling innocent who needs protection. Instead, we bear witness to a darker, more internally turmoiled version of her, hell-bent on getting revenge on the Scottish gangsters who've killed her partner, Gordon. As she prepares to shoot the thugs, she's suddenly abducted and imprisoned, arrested for attempted political assassination by the state, and interrogated as a known accomplice of V, the masked terrorist who's been destroying the fragile peace that the British fascist regime has been trying to uphold. Eve's head is shaved and she's stripped of her humanity. No company saved the rats in her dark, dreary cell. It's during her capture, however, during the onslaught of interrogation and torture that she receives a single glimmer of hope. A note, scrawled on toilet paper and slipped between the cracks of her cell wall by a fellow prisoner. And it's within that note that we learn everything there is to know about love. I don't know who you are, please believe. There is no way I can convince you that this is not one of their tricks, but I don't care. I am me, and I don't know who you are, but I love you. I have a pencil, a little one they did not find. I am a woman, I hid it inside me. Perhaps I won't be able to write again, so this is a long letter about my life. It is the only autobiography I will ever write, and oh god, I'm writing it on toilet paper. It's within our darkest moments that profound wisdom or insight so often comes from the strangest places. In this case, it's from a woman Eve's never seen who's never seen her, a woman who doesn't know who she is or what she's in here for, but who loves her anyways because of the shared nature of their plight. It's a love that's given freely, that's unconditional. And it's that quality of unconditionality that we'll soon come to know is the most powerful form that love can manifest itself as. Valerie's letter is an ode to love and its many forms. She details her history, coming out to her parents as a lesbian and the fallout of their disappointment, chasing her dreams to become an actor and falling in love with one of her co-stars. She describes these years on stage with her partner, Ruth, as the best three years of her life, a time of roses, a time where she began to truly love in the most unapologetic way possible. But like many things in life, it was ultimately fleeting. And when the world collapsed and Britain fell into fascist ruin, as V for Vendetta's alternate history goes, there were no more roses for anybody. In the rest of her letter, Valerie goes on to describe the tenacity of love through the harrowing lens of her history, of the blacks and gays being rounded up and thrown in prisons, of her lover Ruth betraying her to the state after intense torture, and how she would go on to ultimately kill herself over the overwhelming guilt. Valerie's life lesson, the one she both internalized and in this letter wishes to pass on to a stranger, is that despite all the things they do to you, despite all the ways they aim to break you, you must never give away that inch. 
that small, fragile vessel that holds within you all of your integrity, or at the very least, the last semblance of it. It's an integrity that we don't share or have with others, but to ourselves, to the deep core principles that define our identity, the ones that are unshakable and must remain unshakable in the face of those who wish to break us. In the face of fascist regimes, to say it's hard would be an understatement. For years, her love had taken on so many forms from defiant love, the love one experiences in adolescence, especially when that love goes against the wishes of their parents, to unapologetic love, love that doesn't apologize or need to justify its existence to anyone, to love that is resilient, as I mentioned before, love that not only stands up against fascist power structures, despite what the consequences of having that love can bring about, but a love that retains itself even when the ones we love fail to reciprocate not nearly as unshakable as we are. To survive above all else, one must maintain their inch and love the stranger. It's a dual responsibility. You must hold on to the most vulnerable parts of yourself, refusing to reveal them to those powerful and capable of hurting you, while also freely loving those who are caught in the very same struggle you find yourself in. It's why, in her closing remarks, Valerie reinforces the most powerful version of love as being unconditional. I don't know who you are, or whether you're a man or a woman. I may never see you. I will never hug you, or cry with you, or get drunk with you. But I love you. I hope that you escape this place. I hope that the world turns and that things get better, and that one day people have roses again. I wish I could kiss you. Valerie. I know every inch of this cell. This cell knows every inch of me, except one. For those who have read V for Vendetta, you know the more profound, cerebral impact this issue has when reread with the context of the issue that follows it. The reality of Eve's imprisonment, of her true relationship to Valerie, and Valerie's true relationship to V. And it's despite this harrowing detail, one that perhaps speaks to patriarchal power structures found even in the midst of anarchy, that were made privy to the transcendental power of unconditional love as a force that not only breaks cell barriers, but time itself. It showcases love as a universal truth and language in more ways than just one. To live in a time without roses is to live with no external love to give, no constant visual or physical reminder that love exists at all. Instead, the love often has to be secret, less overt. A love that doesn't defiantly declare its own existence to us, but a love that is physically embodied by the people who suffer, in spite of it all the same. What Valerie reveals in issue 6 is that it doesn't take a super-powered resilience to love strongly, but an ordinary one. One exhibited by a single individual who has maybe not the power to change the world, but to change a single person's perspective on that world as they undergo an evocative metamorphosis that begins with understanding, at a basic human level, that they are loved. And while we can guard that inch of ourselves, shielding our hearts and minds from the very real threat of fascism and hatred on a global scale, it's through those moments of shared vulnerability with all the strangers around us that roses can bloom again. Mind Theater is a solo effort produced and written by me, AO King Bade. For updates on the show, as well as my other content, follow Mind Theater Pod on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. If you want to show monetary support, the Kofi link is in the show notes. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next time.